Wait a minute. Have you heard the strange tales of the Whistler? promised me that you wouldn't gamble again. You've broken that promise, and I won't give you another cent. This time, John, you can work it out for yourself. Another Sunday night, and again, CBS presents The Whistler. I, The Whistler, know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, many secrets hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. And so I tell you tonight the amazing story of Avarice. John Abbott lives in a vast house on the outskirts of town. But it isn't John's house. It belongs to his wife. John has never had a penny he could honestly call his own. But then John has always been lucky. John Abbott is somewhat of a gambler who was fortunate enough to marry a wealthy young widow, Marsha Howard, wife of the late motor magnate Burton Howard. But John has pulled a few tricks bordering on the shady side of late, and Marsha has come to distrust him. She has paid off a number of his gambling debts, but this time he's really in a spot. John got into a poker game with Mike Flynn, lost, and paid off with a worthless check. Hello, Mike. How are you? I haven't seen you since that big night last week. Where have you been keeping yourself? Where have you been keeping yourself? Well, my wife's been rather ill, you know. I've intended to get in to see you and the boys for some time. Did you try real hard, John? Try? Why? Uh, what do you mean? I kind of get an idea you were trying to avoid me. Oh, why should I? Would you have dropped in today if Muggsy hadn't tipped you off that I wanted to see you? Why, of course I would. <laughs> You're not pig's eye. I resent that, Mike. You do? Well, I resent this. What? This rubber check. You got a lot of nerve wanting in on a game when you can't pay off. Hmm. Why was it returned? Insufficient funds, according to the slip. Yeah, I can't understand that. Must be some mistake. There's no mistake, John. You didn't have four thousand in the bank, and you knew you didn't. I checked on it. Well, uh, I'll take care of it. You got nothing to worry about. And fork over. I don't carry that much money on me. Then you'd better dig it up, John. Oh, I. I uh, can't walk out and pick it off a tree, you know. You know where to get it in a minute. Do I? Sure. Your wife is rolling in money. That's not as easy as you think. See, Marsha doesn't approve of gambling. Neither do I. When you can't back your bed. Well, uh, I I can get it. You've got to give me a little time. Uh, take a few days. John, I'll give you till Saturday at noon to get me that money. Saturday? That's almost impossible. This is Wednesday. How much time do you need? Well, I don't know, but I'll get it as soon as possible. Do you have to have cash? Not necessarily. I see. What do you have in mind, John? Why, nothing. Nothing at the moment. Better think of something. Yes, I will. Oh, I'll get it. Any good security will do. I quite understand. But whatever it is, I'll expect it by noon Saturday. Otherwise... Well, I could turn it over to the district attorney, or I could have a pal of mine take you for a little drive in the country some afternoon. Oh, I... I'll get it, Mike. I'll, I'll get it. I'll have something for you Saturday at noon. I, I don't know what it'll be, but I'll have it. That's fine, John. It's fine. I'll be expecting you. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for the extension. Sure. Always glad to help out a friend. Yes. Well, so long. So long, John. <laughs> So John Abbott walks out of Mike's office and home in a deep fog, goes to his wife's room on the floor above, slips easily to the side of her bed. Marsha? Hmm? Marsha. Oh, is that you, Nita? Were you asleep, Marsha? John. I'm sorry if I awakened you. What time is it? A little afternoon. Where's Nita? And I haven't seen your sister this morning. She's around someplace, I imagine. What did you want, John? I wanted to ask you something. That is, well, I have a favor to ask. What's troubling you now, John? I hate to bother you when you don't feel well, but I need a little money. 
Money. What is it this time? Your brother again? No, no. It uh, doesn't concern Alan. That's a wonder. How much longer is he going to stay here? I don't know. Is he so obnoxious? I can't understand why a young fellow like Alan should be content to do nothing. Oh, he'll get into something soon, dear. I hope so. What do you need money for, John? A, uh, a note I had came due. What kind of a note? Just a note. I gave it some time ago. How much? Four thousand dollars. Four thousand? Yes. You mean to say that you owe someone four thousand dollars? I'm sorry, Marsha, but I do. When did this happen? Just a week or so ago. You've been gambling again. Do you realize how many thousands of dollars I've given you to pay off such ridiculous debts? Yes, Marsha, but you don't have to shout at me. Only a month ago, you promised you'd never gamble again. And now, $4,000. I didn't mean to get in so deeply, Marsha. I, well, I just dropped in to say hello to a few of the boys, and I had a few drinks, and before I realized it, I was in the hole. Don't blame it on a few drinks. All you need is a deck of cards. Oh, don't rub it in, Marsha. I feel badly enough about it. You do. You sit in on any game you like, regardless of the stakes, and expect me to always pay off. What do you think I am, the mint? Well, you're not broke, Marsha. It's no fault of yours. If I let you handle my money, I wouldn't have a dime. What did you give, an IOU? No, dear, I wrote a check. A check? Why did you do that? You have no account of that size and never did. Well, they wouldn't take my IOU. Who wouldn't take it? Were you playing with Mike Flynn again? Yes. You're a fool, John, an impossible fool. But that isn't the point, my dear. Will you help me? No, John. You promised me that you wouldn't gamble again. You broke that promise and I won't give you a dime. You can work it out for yourself. Where would I get $4,000? Why don't you try working for a change? Well, I don't expect you to give it to me. I'll pay it back. You'll pay it back. Do you think I believe that? You act as though you were down to your last penny. What good does all that money do you anyway? What good will it ever do you? More good than it would ever do you. I might be able to get into some kind of business if I had enough capital. Business? You? Well, what's wrong with that? You talk as though I were a good-for-nothing loafer. You are. You and your brother... I'm sorry I didn't know that before I married you. And now your brother's hanging around here. And what for? Pretending to be in love with my sister. I don't like him and you can tell him to leave. That's right. Get yourself excited over there. I have a good reason to be excited. You're not half as sick as you think. You have all the symptoms of a hypochondriac. Get out of here. Get out of this room. I'm going, I'm going. And tell your brother that I... Oh. Marsha. Oh. Marsha. What's going on in here? What was Marsha yelling about? I don't know. She's fainted. Certainly can get worked up easily. You'd better call Dr. Mann. Very well. I'll call him from downstairs. Dr. Manning. Oh, yes. This is John Abbott. I uh, wonder if you could come over here. Marsha has had another spell. Yes. Very well. Goodbye. What happened, John? I don't know, Ellen. She gets excited over the least little thing. Yeah? What was she yelling about? Oh, I went in to ask her about something and she blew up. What did you say to her? Why? Was it something about me? No, I needed a little money to cover a, a note. And I happened to ask her at the wrong moment. No. Oh. You mean the check, don't you? Check? What do you mean? That $4,000 check you gave Mike Flynn? What do you know about that? I heard about it. So? You think she'll let you have the money? I don't know, Ellen. I... Rather think she will, eventually. What do you mean, eventually? You've got to have it by Saturday. Yes, that's, that's right. Yes, you're in a tough spot, John. Might need to be in your shoes. Why? Mike Flynn is a bad egg to fool around with. I know how to take care of Mike. I hope so. I'm going out for a few moments. I'll be back by the time Dr. Manning gets here. Okay. <laughs> John goes out and walks around for a while, pondering over his predicament. Alan sprawls on the sofa and studies his own personal problem. In a few moments, Nita, Marsha's young sister, comes down the stairs. How is she, Nita? She's a little better. I gave her some of the medicine and she pulled out of it. What upset her? Oh, it doesn't take much to upset Marsha. She's such an unreasonable woman. I wonder what John said to her. Probably some trivial little thing. Mm, maybe... Sometimes I feel I can't stay here another day. Why do you stay, Nita? Well, I... I feel it's my duty to stay. It wouldn't be right to leave Marcia in this condition. Is that the only reason for staying? 
No. Suppose she's angry because of my being here? I don't know. I don't think she likes me very much. I don't know why she should feel that way. I've tried to be nice to her. She doesn't seem to like anyone very well. She makes herself miserable. No one seems to be able to do anything for her. Suppose she resents your being here, Nita? Why should she? Oh, I don't know. She might invent some crazy idea and... Well, I wouldn't want to see her get angry with you, Nita. What reason would she have to do that? Oh, I don't know. I, I was just talking, thinking out loud. What are you trying to say? Do you think that Marsha loves John? I know she doesn't. Do you believe that John loves Marsha? I don't know. I don't see how he could, considering the way she treats him. Poor John is miserable. My heart aches for him. Rita, you know that I love you very much, don't you, darling? Yes. Please, please marry me, Nita. Oh, I, I just can't, Alan. I, I know you love me, but I... I know, I know that I have nothing, but that'll change. I've got a swell job coming up, and I'll make you very happy, Nita. I believe you, Alan. I know you love me, but I... I just can't say yes because... Because of John? <laughs> John is a swell oh. fellow, Nita, but he's a lot older than you. Besides, he's married to Marcia. So what good does it do to you? I can't help it, Alan. I just can't help it. Do you think that John cares for you? I think he does. Has he told you so? No, but... No, it doesn't matter. I worship him. You'll never divorce Marcia. He can't afford to. I know. Then what do you expect to happen? Are you waiting for Marcia to die? Is that it? How can you say such a thing? Oh, why not be frank? Marcia may live for years. No longer you stay around here, the worse it'll be for you. If you married me and got away from here for a while, you'd forget all about John. I don't think so. The longer you stay, the more miserable you'll become. Perhaps. But I can't leave. I can't. I've tried. Very well, Nita. Well, I think you're foolish. Out of your mind. Please, Alan, let me alone. Don't say another word about it, please. Okay. I won't say another word. Not another word. Dr. Manning visits Marsha. John returns to the house. And now the doctor has come downstairs and asks John, Alan, and Nita to join him in the library. I want to have a little talk with the three of you. Yes? About, about Marsha? That's right. How is she, doctor? She's much worse than when I saw her last. Worse? Yes. She's suffered some emotional upset. She can't afford to do that. Her condition is very, very serious. I've warned you before about the result of the slightest argument. Now, I don't know what occurred this morning, but I warn you that another such occurrence will cost her life. Is she that bad? I'm going to be frank with you, John. For her own good, I have to tell her the truth. I think I should tell you. The truth? I doubt if Marcia will live more than a year. What? Yes. On the other hand, if she suffers no further emotional stress, she may live two or three years. Poor Marcia. I didn't realize it was that serious. I'm sorry to have to tell you this, but I feel that you should know all the truth. It is quite a shock, Doctor, but I appreciate your letting me know. Yes, we all do. Of course. Well, I must run along now. I want to have a few words with your housekeeper, Mrs. Simmons, about Marcia's diet. Good day, Doctor, and thanks for coming over. Hmm, it's really serious. I thought Marshall was more or less of a hypochondriac. I really did. Yes, so did I. Well, this puts a new light on the situation. What situation? Hmm? Well, I, I'm i sorry I caused Marshall to become upset. Yes. We must be very careful from now on about what we say to her. Yeah, that's right. Very careful. All of us. Early next morning, John goes into town to have a talk with Mike Flynn, the gambler. Mike isn't in his office, so John drops over to the drugstore to purchase a few articles. Well, uh, how are you, John? I haven't seen you for a week or so. Where have you been keeping yourself? Oh, I've been rather busy the past few days. Yes, what can I do for you? Well, I have a list of things here. Quite a few items. Oh. I'll let you fix them up, and I'll call for them later. Very well. Uh, got some nice specials on today. No, no, just what you see there on the list. Oh, yes, yes, of course. Now, let me see. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I have everything here. I'll be back. Oh, uh, hello, Mike. I was just up to your office. So I hear. Got some good news for me, John? Why, yes. That is, well, I think things are going to be all right. That's so? I'm glad to hear it. For your sake. I, I wanted to ask a little favor of you, Mike. Favor? Yes. Well, I've told you things and what it is. 
What you got in your mind, John? Well, I uh, suppose we go over to your office. Okay. Whatever you say. Uh, just wrap those things up, Mr. Smith. I'll call for them in half hour, so come on, Mike. Then John returns home at noon. Now it is after one. Lunch is over. And John sits at the desk in the library, lost in deep meditation. The library door opens and Nita slips quietly to John's side. John? Uh, oh, yes, Nita. I didn't hear you come in. I opened the door very quietly. I thought you might be taking a nap. No, no, no. I was just thinking things over. I know how you must feel, John. I've developed a bit of a headache. I didn't sleep a wink last night. I'm so sorry for you, John. May, may I rub your head? It might help a little. Oh, thanks, Nita. I'm all tied up in knots. Does that help? Oh, yes, yes. Helps a lot. Sweet of you, Nita. You're an awfully nice girl. Thanks, John. Yes, the man who gets you for a wife is certainly going to be lucky. Think so? I know so. Are you really in love, Nita? Yes, John. I'm sure I am. And I hope it lasts. But with a girl like you, sweet and kind and gentle, it's bound to last. Yes? You know, Alan is a very good boy, but he's got to be handled carefully. He's quite a bit like me. I know my shortcomings, and Alan has the same. We were both raised with a silver spoon in our mouths. Then we were suddenly thrown out into the world on our own, and we just couldn't take it. I had nothing to offer anyone, so I just followed the line of least resistance. Have you, John? Ellen is just like me, but fortunately he's young enough to be changed. He can learn new tricks. The right girl could help. And you are the right girl. Think so? Yes, you're as different from your sister as night from day. But I don't love Alan. But you just said you did. No, John, I didn't. I did say I was in love, but not with Alan. But he's mad about you, Nita. I know, he's nice, but I don't love him and, and never will. Well, then if you're in love and it isn't Alan, then who is he? Don't you know? No. Oh, oh John. John. Nita. Oh, Nita. Oh, John, forgive me, but I, I can't help it. What do you mean? Don't you know, John? Look at me, Nita. Yes, John, I know it's despicable, but I, I can't help it. I love you. Well, of all things, Nita. I've loved you from the day we first met. But, Nita, darling, this what's ridiculous. You can't mean it. I do, I do. I've tried to fight it, but I can't. I'm married to your sister. Marcia doesn't love you, not the way I do, and you don't love Marcia. How do you know that? I can tell, I know. Oh, you're miserable, John. Am I? Yes. Marcia has treated you terribly. How you've gone on this long, I'll never understand. But I love you. I'll always love you. Don't you care for me at all? Yes, Nita. I'll have to confess. I do. Oh, John. John, darling. Oh, it won't work. In the first place, I'm married to Marcia. In the second place, I'm older than you. In the third place, yes. I'm in a spot, a very ticklish spot. I can't afford to, well, break off with Marcia. What do you mean? I owe a certain man $4,000. I must pay him by this coming Saturday or I might go to jail. What? Oh, he couldn't do that. Yes, he could. And he might even take me for a ride. Kill you? Yes. Oh, John. Did, did you tell Marcia? That was the cause of her relapse. She refused? Absolutely. Well, that only proves she doesn't love you. She's mean and hateful. Sometimes I think she's insane. Do you? Maybe she is. You mustn't give up hope, John. You'll get the money. How? There'll be a way, John. There must be a way. We'll make a way. Make a way? What do you mean? I'm not sure. But we'll find it. Then a short while later, the housekeeper, Mrs. Simmons, comes to Marsha's room to take away the luncheon tray. Did you enjoy your lunch, Mrs. Evans? I thought I'd pick up the tray and dishes. Well, 
Ice cream. Where'd you get the ice cream? I didn't serve you any ice cream. Mrs. Abbott, are you asleep? If you'd wanted ice cream, you could have told me. Mrs. Abbott. Mrs. Abbott. Lucy, I'm she's cold. Mrs. Abbott. Mrs. Abbott. She's dead. She's dead. Give me the police. An ambulance. A doctor. <laughs> police arrived. The ambulance arrived. But Marsha was dead. Quite dead. Why the police were called, only the housekeeper knew. But once the police arrived, they followed it through to an office. Now the officers have returned to the Abbott residence. Captain Barnes is speaking. You, uh, you're Mrs. Simmons, the housekeeper? Yes, that I am. Mm-hmm. And you're Nita, Mrs. Abbott's sister? Yes. And you? I'm Ellen Abbott. John Abbott's brother. You live here? I'm visiting here. Let me see. Mrs. Simmons, you served lunch to Mrs. Abbott? I did. What did you serve? I served uh, chicken soup, cream carrots, toast and tea. And uh, ice cream? No. You didn't serve ice cream? I did not. Are you positive, Mrs. Simmons? I'm positive. You don't have to shout. I thought you didn't hear me. I heard you. Will you two step out of the room for a moment? I want to talk to the housekeeper alone. Of course, Captain. Certainly. Mrs. Simmons, uh, how long have you been with Mrs. Abbott? You mean, how long have I worked here? That's right. Too long. Didn't you like it here? I don't want to talk about it. Didn't you like Mrs. Abbott? I certainly did. She was so good to me. I worshipped her. Poor thing. Poor thing. You, uh, <clears throat> you came here the day she married her first husband, didn't you? Yes, and they were so happy. It was very pleasant here then. You mean there came a time when things ceased to be pleasant? Yes, that's what I mean. When did things take on a change? After she married John Abbott. How long after she married Abbott did her health begin to fail? It was about a year. Did they quarrel often? Yes, quite a bit. What about? Well, about money. Mr. Abbott didn't have a cent when they were married. And he's never earned a cent nor done a day's work since. He was always gambling, always losing money. Her money. Then she got disgusted and clamped down on him. And shortly after that, she began to fail. Yes, and she changed completely. She became morose and cranky. You just can't realize what a change there was in her, unless you knew her. How long has Alan Abbott been visiting here? Visiting? Mm hmm. He's way past the visiting stage, the lazy loafer. Been living here over six months. How long has Nita been here? Um, she came to live here over a year ago. Mrs. Abbott asked her to stay with her when she first took ill. And that was a big mistake. Mistake? To have her sister here? What do you mean? I'm talking too much. I don't want to get mixed up in this. I'm leaving this house. I'm afraid you're going to stay right here, Mrs. Simmons, until I tell you to go. You. You mean I'm arrested? We call it detained until this is cleared up. What are you doing here anyway? Why are you snooping around asking so many questions? Why did you call the police when you found the body? I, I don't know. I, I was just excited. You didn't call the doctor. You called the police. What was in your mind to cause you to call the police instantly? I, I don't know. I, I, I really don't know. She's had bad attacks before, and you always called Dr. Manning. But this time you called us. Why? I, I don't know. Then I'll tell you because you knew she'd been murdered. Murdered? Murdered? I didn't. I didn't. Then you must have suspected it. Who did you suspect her? Husband? No. Alan? No. Neither? I, I don't know what you're talking about. Then it must have been you who served the ice cream. I didn't serve but ice cream. But it was served. And there was arsenic in it. Arsenic? Rat poison. Mrs. Abbott was murdered. Oh, I knew it. I knew it. Her husband did it. No, she did it. Neither did it. Why? Because she was madly in love with John. She wanted Marsha out of the way. I knew she was a devil. Bring them all in, Murphy. Nina, your sister was served ice cream at lunch in this dish. Mrs. Simmons says she didn't serve it. Well, what about it? I'll ask you that. What do you know about it? Why, I... I... Wait a minute. What's the ice cream got to do with it? I'll tell you in a moment. Did you serve that ice cream, Nina? You don't have to answer that, Nina. Did you? Yes. Yes, I did serve it. What did I tell you? Where did you get the arsenic? What? Arsenic? Mrs. Abbott died of arsenical poisoning. This dish contains arsenic. Where did you get it? Why should I do such a thing? You had a motive. You were in love with John and wanted your sister out of the way. That isn't true. You bought the ice cream and you served it. I did not buy it. Then where did you get it? Uh, I I don't know. You'd better tell. You're in a tough spot. Wait a minute. Nita did not do it. She couldn't have done such a thing. I bought the ice cream. I gave it to Nita to serve to Marsha. And you put the arsenic in it. Nita would never do that. She isn't the kind. John did it. And he had a motive. What motive? He gave Mike Flynn a rubber check for $4,000. Mike gave him till Saturday or he'd turn it over to the D.A. Marsha refused to help John out, so he killed her. 
Is that true about the check? Yes, but I didn't kill Marsha. That's ridiculous. Of course it is. And if anybody had a motive to kill her, it was Alan. What? Yes. Alan was in love with me. Asked me to marry him. But I knew what was back of it. Nita. He wanted to marry the money he knew Marsha would leave to me. I did not. I told him I loved John and turned him down. He was jealous of John. If Alan poisoned Marsha, he figured John would be blamed and that would put John out of the way. He put the arsenic in the ice cream. He must have. It's crazy, absolutely crazy. He's not the only one. The housekeeper accuses Nita. Nita accuses Alan. Alan accuses John. And both men trying to protect Nita. But I've got a piece of evidence that definitely pins it on one of it. How about it, Sergeant? What'd you find? I checked the box of rat poison we found in the pantry. Purchased yesterday noon, and the poison register was signed by John Abbott. The druggist confirmed it. All right, John? Yes, yes, I bought it, but I swear I'm innocent. The evidence is all against you, John. And as Tanita's part in it, well, it'll all come out in the trial. But wait, it isn't over yet. The door bursts open and Dr. Manning rushes in, waving a special delivery letter just received at his office. Made it, Doctor. Listen to this. John doesn't love me. He cares for nothing but my money. He's in a spot over a bad check, a spot in which he deserves to be. Alan is no good and pretends to be in love with Nita... But he really wants to marry her for the money he thinks I'll leave her. My sister is in love with my husband, which disgusts me. If I leave my property to her, John will marry her at the first opportunity. This house is filled with nothing but avarice and greed. I can bear it no longer. The thought of hanging on to life under these conditions for another year is intolerable. A few minutes ago, I slipped down the back way and found some rat poison. We moved a portion of it it back to my room and mixed it with the ice cream. Enclosed a short will, witnessed by Mrs. Simmons. I leave all my property, personal and real, to the children's home at Montebello. This will end the disgusting situation created by my late husband's fortune. Signed, Marsha Howard Adams. Well, there you are. None of them killed Marsha, but they certainly had the motive. Now, all of them are left to face the world penniless. And there's still a $4,000 check standing between John and Mita. Too bad. CBS has presented The Whistler. Original music for this production was composed and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. The Whistler is written and directed by J. Donald Wilson and originates from Columbia Square in Hollywood. Next week, same time... I, The Whistler, will return to tell you another unusual tale. Good night. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.